Welcome to Legit Lit, Volume 1. We're streaming at this time. My name's Sean Gervin. I'm the program manager of the Muse Writer Center. Very happy that you're joining us today uh, via the internet. So we have, lucky for us, we have the same five readers that were going to read for us in March. So I'm very excited that we have these wonderful writers uh, to read their work. Um, we have this version of Legit Lit is the first one where we wanted to uh, kind of have the best and the best, in my opinion. So I picked these people out and we went with uh, uh, poets and uh, flash prose writers. And among other things, they can write many things, I'm sure. But um, this is the stuff that they write that I really like a lot. And um, I decided to uh, um, ask them if they would read for us. And they said yes. And then everything happened. And then I said, will you read for us again, but on the internet? And they said, yes. So here they are. And we're very excited to have them. So we're going to kick this off right now. Um, you can uh, watch. Uh, this will be online for a week or two and on this spot, wherever you're watching it from right now. And it will also be on Facebook too. So you can go back and watch it. Um, just keep in mind, the Muse has classes coming up still. We're, we're not going anywhere. The-muse.org. If you go to our class section, you'll see about uh, 12 or 14 seminars that have yet started on Saturdays or Sundays. And guess what? You can take them no matter where you are. Anywhere in the country, you could take them or in the world, actually. You could just uh, sign on and uh, sign up for a class and join us via Zoom and, and work with some of your favorite teachers. So if uh, you moved away or if you we're really planning on taking one of those classes that they're going to be there. So check us out, the-muse.org. So I'm going to kick this uh, kick this off right now. <clears throat> First, uh, we have uh, someone from out of town. He's from uh, Tallahassee, Florida. That's where he is right now. Um, and he's a poet that I met at AWP a little while ago. And uh, I bought a book from him. And he signed it to the Muse, very nice. And then he um, contacted me a little later and goes, hey, I'm going around Virginia. Can I read at the Muse? And I go, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Let's let's do that. And then he unfortunately couldn't come and we didn't have the event. So when I asked him to do it again, he said that was great. So his name is Craig Bevan and he's going to join us right now. Craig? Hi. All right. So this is Craig Bevan. Take it away, Craig. Thanks a lot. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. I'm reading from my book, um, Natural History. As Sean pointed out, I had this big elaborate like six city tour um, scheduled. And then of course there was a pandemic. So I'm uh, really grateful to be reading in this context. Uh, so I'll be reading from my first book. Uh, this first poem is called Preservation. Nothing can be spared from time. Just don't tell the donors. Here in the museum, it seems human endeavor is winning. The finest non-reflective glass allows Lama deity to be in this room and in its own room where breath can't touch it. Pre-Elamite, we hold it in Texas, shoot it for the archives. It makes sense that all our donors have the age cut from their faces, hair sewn onto their hair, breasts dialed back 40 years or more. A museum is a monument to death aversion. As the hurricane approached, still 12 hours away, still hot and sunny in our part of the sky, we went out with all of our neighbors to photograph our houses for insurance. Roof torn away tonight, tree through a window. You will need proof that yesterday things existed intact. My neighbor walks me through it. We tied our lawn furniture to a tree, brought our plants in, before and after, signs under the sill of horizontal rain damage. You have to imagine what will be destroyed and how. Shoot your car in the driveway, the tree over your car. Inside, I open my closet door and try to get all the shirts in the frame. These are my clothes. This is my stuff. If everything in this photo is gone tomorrow, I want everything here given back. This next one is called Unpacking the Stone Buddha. Like all weaklings, I desire something more. 
intangible but shaded and cool, just on the other side of this high stone wall, the loose clear chime of icing glasses and someone diving into a pool. It's only Wednesday afternoon, but there's a little garden party. Tuxedoed men with silver trays, quiet laughter. You catch glimpses through the hedges or ivory covered iron bars. They have a shaded grass median to jog through. There is a quiet intersection with stone gazebo and fountain. You can turn the corner and relax in the sculpture garden among ancient masterpieces, among modern works few people understand. Across the street in the Museum of Fine Art, they're unpacking the stone Buddha from its wooden crate. At 11 a.m., it's 99 degrees and 80% humidity. The lawn crews throughout the city seem unfazed. In the basement, unseen by Houston's millions, they unpack the stone Buddha on loan from Ho Chi Minh City. Sandstone, 2,000 years old, removed from the earth in 1863, buried there, they believe, by flood. No one knows about this. No one comes to see it three months on display, a basement gallery where no sun can touch it, dimmed lights and dark painted walls most guests mistake is closed. I leave my office with headaches from the cold air we're piping in and walk the rich neighborhood. By living here, they can keep everything at bay even seasons. When the flowers stop blooming, they're dug out. With money, they have conquered landscape, the drab moments between color. In the basement, the stone Buddha. Cut from the rock, polished down to these thin fingers, one foot raised as if about to step down from the two by fours into a strange kind of afterlife. Down in this dark room, we're trying to bury it like the river, to put it back where it belongs. We're holding our breath with a crowbar, popping each board. It can only be lifted out by hand. We must touch it. The contract says no one can touch it. I go look at it, squinting through the dark. When our three months expire, we send it back. Uh, this is a poem, an ekphrastic poem on the um, Andrew Wyeth painting Braids. It's just a woman with like super intricate detail of braids. <clears throat> braids. I believed in seeing a painting in person after years of reproductions. Was I passionate or just naive? In Braids, nothing happens. In Andrew Wyeth's braids, there is only each piece of hair known intimately by God and the painter, strand and strand brought in to hold its own turning. High school art history and it beats across the screen, moat modeled, projection warped. Years later, I drove three days to stand here. This is where he stood, arms linked from the canvas. This is Maine at the end of April. Tomorrow it snows, and we watch an old man march into the ocean, submerge himself, walk out and shake it off. Why, standing at braids, can I think not of this painting, but of approaching press 40, the day after graduating high school, and what conspires to make the plant form and start me at press 40, of 44 presses in the factory? What does Wyeth have to do with graveyard shift making dashboards, except for fathers and concentration? The guy at 39 has sleeves of scar tissue, a purple luminescence poorly stitched on. Press 40 is the largest machine in the state. I know because my father built it. It slows my work to realize, have I seen this before in dream? Drafting table, white lines on blue paper, the ghost of it emerging with each revision. He brought me here as a kid to explain how it works, describe the tonnage, the many men it took. My father who was at that moment asleep, who I would pass in the kitchen this morning on my way to bed, on his way here to see how I did. 
and if they need anything, replacement parts or adjustments. So I came to the far edge of a continent. So I walked through the field from Christina's world. Why save any of this from the fire? Dear origin myth, are you in art history class or night shift hours sanding the rough edges of dashboards? I was there as a way of apologizing, but no one heard it amid the din. No one noticed such a gesture in the filing away of excess plastic. In braids, she stands alone in a cold, dark room looking away. Someone is calling, but it doesn't break her spell. They've been calling forever, but they don't know her name. The house is empty and quiet. This is the story of your life. I'm just gonna do one more for my book. Um, thank you again, Sean and the Muse. This is really wonderful. Um, when I wrote this first book, my son was just about to be born and I had to go to Vermont for 30 days to do this writing studio. And um, I knew at the end of those 30 days I was going to come back. So I would take these long walks. Uh, this is called Stargazer's Field. It's a hill in the top of um, Johnson, the city where I was in Vermont. Stargazer's Field. Days before you were born, I walked to the top of the mountain. There were further higher peaks and snow falling on them, white filling in between black pines. The sky seemed closer than the earth. I thought of the distance between you and I and how I would bridge that distance. At the top of the mountain, they raised sheep and rams in separate pens, a thin line of wire between them. I knew that thin line. If you were to touch it, it would warm your hands. You would feel it in your bones. And although the rams wanted to cross, they had learned not to. They stood perfectly still in the snow, occasionally dipping for a mouthful of grass. People have been walking up the mountain for thousands of years to look out at the bowl of mountains. South beyond the valley, as land slopes to the sea, you were wading across a continent just days to be born. I thought of you safe in your dark water and thought of you in 10 years. We will walk up here together to look at the ramps, to look out into the valley. We will see mountains and as clouds move, further mountains, like a curtain pulling back across a stage. We will hear the report of rifle shot. We will wear orange vests that say, don't shoot, I'm human. Thank you very much for letting me do this. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Christina Flores and I teach English um, mostly at the high school level, but I also teach uh, nonfiction in a flash at the Muse on Mondays. And I'm very excited to be able to share some of my work. I'm reading um, some flash memoir, so very short pieces. The first one is called At Arm's Length. Courtney and I race down the street towards the ice cream truck. Like always, she is winning. But if I reach out and stretch my fingertips, I can almost touch the long strands of blonde hair whipping out behind her as she runs. She is only an arm's length away until she sees Stephanie and Aaron, two of the most popular girls in our grade, and the distance between us widens just like that. And with a smile, she eases into their conversation and the front of the line. I take my place in the back, fix my eyes on a crack in the sidewalk, my hands hidden in my pockets, counting quarters as I rehearse my order. One nutty buddy and a ring pop, please. One nutty buddy and a ring pop. I don't notice that the line has moved, that Stephanie and Aaron are already pulling apart a twin pop as they walk back home, that it's my turn. I don't notice until Danny Evans yells at me to move my fat ass and pushes me so hard, I almost fall. Then he and his friends oink in between gasps of laughter. I look up at the sky to keep my tears from slipping out of the corners of my eyes. And when the ice cream man asks what I want, I can't speak. So he offers me the first thing he grabs from the freezer case. 
I take it and run back down the street where Courtney sits on the curb waiting. She dips a candy stick into a pouch of grape flavored sugar, smiles and pats the space beside her. Then I peel the white paper carefully from my ice cream sandwich and lick sticky chocolate cookie from my fingertips. Safe in her orbit, I release a long breath and then completely by accident, I blurt it out. What's it like? What's what like? And I realized I have no idea why I asked that. I guess I just wanted to know what it's like to be liked, to have people think you're cool, to be able to talk to girls like Stephanie and Aaron, to buy a packet of Fun Dip and a huge box of nerds without people making fun of you, to not have to go the other way when you see Danny Evans or Chris L or Reggie, to be called by your own name, not Tubbs or Lardo, to have blue eyes and freckles on your nose and long honey colored hair that flies like bicycle streamers when you run. What's it like? What's it like to be blonde? She crinkles her brow and looks at me completely confused. Then she throws her head back and laughs. All right, the next piece um, is called Twilight and it appeared in the December issue of Hippocampus. Twilight, it was your idea. When we had already done all there was to do in a summer, when we had beaten every level of Super Mario Brothers twice, when we had played every board game stacked in the guest room closet, when we had called Paul M and hung up 15 times, when we had rifled through your father's Playboy collection, when there was nothing else to do but clean your room and decide which toys you'd give away to Goodwill, you found My Little Pony and asked if I wanted to play. I shrugged, but you insisted and tore your room apart until you found Firefly and handed her to me. So we built palaces from shoe boxes and played like we used to when both time and space dissolved. We played until your parents came home from work and yelled at you for not being ready. It's okay, I told you. We can play tomorrow. The next morning, you answered your door in your bikini. You grabbed me by the hand and pulled me into you. You had so much to tell me. But Ryan was on his way over, a boy who had met last night at your mother's office party. He was so cute and funny, and you talked all night on the phone, and today he's taking you to Wildwater Rapids. So I didn't want to tell you that I had brought a backpack stuffed with ponies, that I had spent an hour last night in the hot attic digging through plastic bins until I found Twilight, my favorite, and Moonbeam, yours, that I had washed them in warm, soapy water, that I had dried their tails and manes with my sister's blow dryer so that they were new again. Instead, I let you do the final touches of your makeup, closing the door behind me as I left. All right, this piece is called Small Talk and it's forthcoming in Thin Air Magazine. The question floats to the surface of our conversation, kicked loose from a crevice, despite my care to walk over words and step around sentences. Are you two planning on having any children? I want to tell you, yes, that ever since I was a little girl, I fantasized about having six. Now at my age, I guess I'd settle for three, but at least a daughter. I always wanted a daughter named Scheherazade, even though my mother thought it was absolutely ridiculous. Christina, think about how people will misspell it, mispronounce it, but she knew I had my mindset. And so I want to tell you about the box in the attic filled with all the things she collected toys, pictures, and a child's dining set depicting scenes from 1001 Nights. And then there are the things she made when she realized she would die by the end of a year. Halloween treat bags, onesies, booties, blankets. So then I want to tell you about when Kevin and I first met and I told him Scheherazade was a non-negotiable. He smiled and asked if we could call her Sadie for short. And so I want to tell you about the ovulation kits and pregnancy tests, about those two suspiciously late and painful and bloody periods. And I wanna tell you about the days I can't drag myself out of bed, about the therapist and the antidepressants. And then I wanna tell you about the adoption and foster care seminars, the doctor's visits, the test, the list of procedures not covered by insurance. And I wanna tell you about the anxiety, about how I have no idea how we can pay for it all, much less what comes after diapers, daycare, college, on two teacher salaries. So then 
I want to tell you about the day I took Kevin by the hand and said, I give up. Let's just live our lives. And then I want to tell you about the moments when I'm lost in the garden of forking paths, when I can't find my way out of the what ifs, when I think this actually might be the greatest thing that has ever happened to me. And I wonder when I can tell you all this and believe it. So instead, I simply shrug and say, you know, we never gave it much thought. Okay, the last piece um, is a micro flash piece. Um, it appeared in the February uh, Palm Journal. It's called Doopy Doopy Doo. When I can't sleep, when the anxiety gnaws at the edges of my frame, brain, fraying my wires and sparking panic, you place your index and middle finger on my shoulder and after a dramatic pause, make them dance like rockets, one high kick after the other as you sing doopy 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 do until the worry scattered to their warrens like mice. Thank you. Wow, that was awesome, Christina. And I enjoyed your reading as well, Craig. I mean, such beautiful work. Uh, my name is Desiree Cooper. Um, I wanna thank the Muse for making this possible and um, for bringing people all over the world into our world. Um, I'm gonna be reading from my collection of flash fiction called Know the Mother. Um, if you wanna know more about it, you can always go to my website. It's descooper.com, D-E-S, Des Cooper. So the first um, piece that I'm gonna read you is, um, is a surrealist piece and it is fiction and it's concerned about aging and body. And it's called Soft Landing. I don't know how many of you guys have ever had um, dreams about flying, but I've had lots of dreams about flying. It used to be a recurring dream. And um, for me, it is a wonderful dream. For some people they're scared and they're gonna fall off a cliff or they're gonna die. But for me, it's just this amazing freedom. And I wanted to try to capture that on, um, on paper. So here it is, one. One night as I lay awake in the sweltering darkness, the stars called me back to the beginning. I went outside and gazed skyward where Orion hung low and the Milky Way dangled within reach. A current of evolution stirred. I was certain of my fetal wings. Pressing my bare soles against the damp ground, I angled my crooked spine and pushed up on swollen knees. I was aloft. I should have been ashamed, a woman of a certain age allowing the world to see her nethers as she soared toward an antique moon, but no. The thrill of the evening breeze lifting my thin gown only made me laugh. My center of gravity shifted. The years molted away like useless feathers. Circling over all that I knew, I saw the sorrows and joys blinking below me like runway lights. My slack biceps became an aileron, my calcified trunk a fuselage. The air rushed over my hump of my back, creating lift. The vertigo of natural forces, the glide of ancient impulses. It was as easy as dreaming. Night after night, I took to the air. Sometimes I could sense the rippling currents, the way a familiar room feels when a stranger has lingered. And then I knew I was part of an invisible flock. There were others who had remembered the time before time when we all had wings. Two, the gate for my plane was at the end of concourse B. I made my way slowly on thick Birkenstocks, bewildered by all the rushing to nowhere. The horde of travelers parted around me, a stream flowing around a heavy stone. I arrived at my gate with 45 minutes to spare. Resting in the boarding area, I picked them out easily. The splotched man with goggle-like sunglasses who wouldn't stop tilting his face toward the sun. The woman wearing a billowy, a billowy blue muumuu, fat flaps beneath her arms. The somber gentleman in a wheelchair with reedy legs and owl eyes. The squat woman with broad shoulders whose grandchildren ambled behind her in a V. When the plane arrived, these were the people who boarded first, all of us hollow bone creatures who required extra time. 
My seatmate was a twitchy man with a sharp nose and eagle black eyes. As the engines ignited, he gave me a dentured smile. An hour into the flight, I was jostled awake by the turbulence. I glanced at the man beside me, resisting the urge to grab his hand. It was then that I noticed his feet planted on the floor, legs rigid, and I could tell he was doing the same thing I was doing, pressing his soles against the metal floor, ready to leap. When the engine spit fire over the Rockies, my heart stuttered against my rib cage. Outside of the window, the sun spilled vermilion. Behind us, a plume of dark black smoke. Fasten your seatbelts and place your head down on your knees. The women screamed, the men sobbed into their hands. As the plane dove, the cabin walls groaned. Luggage shifted in the holds, strangers united in prayer. My seatmate, however, was unafraid. Against instructions, we unfastened our seatbelts, knotted our hands together, and waited. 200 bodies thundered into the sky. The air snatched our voices. People fell like rain. But those of us who remembered threw open our arms and flew. So I'm going to read uh, just one other piece, and it's newish. Um, and I thought it was appropriate for where many of us find ourselves now. I'm the caregiver of both of my parents who have Alzheimer's, and we have a lot of time on our hands. We've been social distanced for a little while. Um, and I was writing this about that, but I think it, it might apply to many of us now. So here it is, waste not. My parents are old and inert. Their bodies only want to be still. There's not much we can do for entertainment, except here, sit here, and then for a change of scenery, sit there. When the weather is nice, and sometimes even when the rain is gentle, I lift the garage door and we sit just inside the lip and watch the neighbors come and go. Sometimes we sip Cokes, sometimes we snack. Sometimes we have music, a little Motown or Boots Randolph to help mark the time. But mostly we sit for hours and say nothing or listen to the rolling tide of my father's circling questions. I remember the years when time was my enemy, invisible and cruel, like gravity. It would barrel forward so furiously I had no idea where it went. It passed in a gust of overwhelm. It had pressure, but no weight. It had seasons, but no flavor. We are closer to the end of our lives than to the beginning. If anyone, we should know better than to throw away our uncertain measure. We should be scurrying and feathering, but we aren't. Time stretching language in the humid afternoon tastes like caramel cake. It smells like pine needles in the rain. Every second, it's a different thing. As light goes white, then yellow, then crimson, then indigo. Our days cannot be hoarded. In these last luxurious hours, we spend as much time as we want. Thanks. Hi everyone, it's Luisa Gloria here. And I just wanna thank uh, Sean and the muse, Michael Candelal and Anna for setting up uh, this reading, which we can share with everybody. Thank you, Craig and Christina and Desiree for your words, amazing words. I'm going to read mostly new poems this afternoon. Um, and I don't know what it is, but I think um, some of you know that I do a daily writing practice. And for some reason, all I can write about is what we are all going through. So <laughs> I'll read from some of those. And the first one is about uh, the time when we used to go into offices and have a fixed routine. It's called Mathematics of Circular Motion. Where does the sky most feel that it is about to crumble, then above a room full of people making uniform, rapid movements eight hours a day in cubicles all in a row? There are ceilings so soft, they can only be held up by the ticking of a room full of clocks. Their angled tops remind me 
of churches in my hometown. As children, we like to tilt our heads and look straight up at the steeple until it seemed we felt the sky unhinge and the world revolve around that point. This next poem is called In Shelter. April, with cities not yet completely convinced that the air they breathe is filled with millions of lethal particles. What is the difference between air modeled with simple burnished dust and this plague that enters our houses to take up residence in the upside down chandeliers next to our hearts. Time is out of its usual dispensers. No more horse-drawn carriages clocking circles around the park. No more logbooks and sign-in sheets spread open in building lobbies. No more waiting in line for tables. The Spanish bluebells are out. Streams begin to clear of softwood and rot. And the heart of day seems as quiet as night. How did it take so long to get to this place of listening with that deep silence, the only thing that's returned to us? Also um, a poem called Training. Doesn't it feel as though you've been practicing for this moment all your life? Like didn't your parents make sure every part of the animal or plant sacrificed for your use had some practical application down to the last oily whisker and scraped cavity of marrow bone? Weren't you told to straighten your back and look without cringing at the fish eyeball swimming in soup? Your grandmother crouched through the forest, pregnant with your mother, as bombs fell and sniper fire zinged through the slats of night. Your grandfather walked, prodded by bayonets, his arms behind his head. How many miles before they were herded into a camp where they waited? five men to a cot for deliverance. The only mantra they taught you was be prepared. Henceforth, even in the face of what no one could ever know was coming, they added to their hidden stores of rice in the cellar, built walls of canned goods, deposited flour and sugar and salt down the empty mouth of every plastic container. Bootleggers of grim hope. They were always tensing for the future while keeping one eye open for an exit sign, a hidden trapdoor leading away from this moment backed against a wall. I'll read maybe two or three more short ones. This one is called stockpile. We've heard this word a lot these days. So stockpile. What is a pile of things but an accumulation? What is stock but merchandise or goods meant for widespread distribution? And the value, actual or imagined from moving the pile of things onto a chain of profit from demand. What is a pile of random objects rotting in a shed? And does it compare to a pile of ventilators counted and willfully held in bales on pallets? What kind of stock do you put on hot items? Do you hoard them and bide your time? Wait till the clamor rises as the collective sound of desperate choking as the rumble of trucks and convoy hauling away piles of body bags. What is a pile of equipment? Hundreds of thousands of filters and masks stocked in a government warehouse. What is a portent of rodents doing? Chewing at ropes and plastic sheeting 
or a cortege or birds circling the cities, drawn fever stench of death after death after death. So um, two more. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, this poem is called On the Orbit of Socially Distanced Bodies. And there is a little epigraph uh, about the motion of planets. In retrograde motion, each planet seems to slow down at times, then move in reverse or retrograde before resuming its course. This is also a poem I think that speaks to our uh, social nature. We just can't help you know, wanting to commune with other people. So here's to that hope of being able to do that soon. On the orbit of socially distanced bodies. In grocery stores, now there are stick-on decals on the floor that show customers where they must stand in relation to others. Walking in the neighborhood, we try to skirt around other people, taking advantage of the spring sunlight, the sight of trees recovering leaves and buds, the river no longer wearing drab winter threads. In Ptolemy's model, where the earth stands still at the center of the universe, all heavenly bodies should trace a perfect circle around the earth, but they also wobble, slowing down as they move farther away and speeding up as they come closer again. Secluded now for weeks in our homes, not going to work or school or church, not eating out or seeing anyone except whoever is sheltering in place with us. It's as if we share that same eccentricity of movement and our bodies quicken at the sight of other bodies just out walking, trying, but not always able to keep to their own path. And I'll end with a final uh, short poem called To Joy. Head dangling from the stem of your neck, think of bells, the weight of lilac blooms clustered around the stalk that bows, yet doesn't let them go. Hinge forward from the hip, then open up in reverse swan dive. In a dream, my arms fill with other than air, a wild bouquet, its scent urging me on to an appointment I know I could be late for, because often I am accused of worrying about the mundane, from the French mundane, meaning of this world, but also orderly. And my love stood at one end of a hallway, gesturing for me to come. It will be just us and our vows. Yet how are there those who don't seem to have any uncertainty about the future, about anything like consequence for whatever they might do, whatever door they might break to enter? Through a keyhole, see how they sweep arcs without hesitation, but shade their eyes against the sun's gold downpour. A speck gleams across emerald lawns, blue water, are living and dying, arrows notched towards what's human, what we remember of the country of joy. Thank you so much and stay well, friends. Um, oh, that's terrific. So uh, what a pleasure. I can't believe it's already my turn. Uh, all of those readings were superb. It's just wonderful um, to listen to you all. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna read, I'll begin with a poem by Dylan Thomas, uh, which is a poem about being alone and writing, um, but, not about, but not feeling alone. Um, and it's called In My Craft or Sullen Art. In my craft or sullen art exercised in the still night when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms. I labor by singing light, not for ambition or bread, nor the strut and trade of charms on the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. 
Not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write on these spindrift pages, nor for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms around the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. Uh, this is a poem from my first book. Uh, it's called Made of Coral. <clears throat> ah, to be corpuscular and jagged, a coral shaped by the movement of water and living at an unusual slow speed and an occurrence in the movement of the water, a moment in the life of someone else, someone who watches leaning here, just here above me. Again, the dust I swept already and again, the fuzz fronds, the weird smearing of that color red on my bed. My mind's gone all corpuscular. The hands are red, which grope it, it's torn. He knows the red spots will be cancerous. She knows nobody really talks until she leaves the room. No happiness like theirs was ever painted in the caves in France. Snow lands on their scalped heads, speeds the little ones to hell or heaven. Fire colored light shines between their ribs and cleans a salt wash in her mouth, a heart still flopping. Smell the bodies being buried who were they sharecropped. Shaped by corpuscular muses, a wave or an ember catching, a color like a kid pissed there. Fuzz fronds smearing their pale hands on my beloved's heart. Tap and grind little teeth gnawing a lamp cord. The gift is was, the gift is beyond. I think a thing like this um, is particularly, like everything else in life, is particularly hard on those uh, who don't have as much, uh, don't enjoy the, the blessings or what I would consider the right of a, of a place to live, some place to, to go inside and go to bed. This is a poem in the voice of a person, a homeless uh, woman whose parental rights have been terminated. Um, she's had multiple drug convictions and the state has decided she's never ever again going to be the, the mother of her, her children. <clears throat> Cold sweat. They told me it's disease with tendrils, not a sin. The clock in the center of town has stopped at 305. It took like minutes for the judge to decide and my children are to be raised by the government. The clock in the center of town has stopped at 305 because it seems of my absent-mindedness and my children are gonna be raised by some government. In sleep, I hear laughter. It echoes under my scraped hide. The way I remember it was just like absent-mindedness. I hovered, listless as the sound of some flute, but I was not what they call a provider. I sleep in eternal laughter an echo under a scraped hide, where for a while each night I rest, hovering listless as flutes. But I was not a provider. I have a disease, it has tendrils, but it feels like a sin. Under a scraped hide, for a while each night, I rest beneath the town clock, which is stopped at 3.05. I'm going to read from a, a poem of my own rendering. I have a very dear friend from Istanbul, Turkey, uh, named Mehmet Bozoglu, and I have to tell you about him because I don't, I've taken some Turkish lessons, but I really couldn't do any translations of a Turkish poem without Mehmet um, doing the trots and helping me finish them. Uh, Nazım Hikmet is one of the great poets in history and one of my favorites. This is Life and How to Live It. Let's say you are sick, sick to danger and needing surgery, laid open on the white expanse. One possibility is never waking up. Even if it is impossible, really, to feel the true sorrows you're dying too early will bring, 
you could know still some thrill or quick terror and still could be chortling at a Bektashi joke, still could be seeing your city's rooftops through the window as it rains, still could be wondering what the latest news is. Let's say your blood is up. Let's say it's worth it, like Nazis are back. There's no lying this time. You're right at the front where you should be, right there for the first shot from the first motherfucker. And let's say it hits you right in the face as you fall, as you die on the irrelevant ground. Your face can still show strange passion. The twists and concertos in your wincing eyes a wonder and you in pain dying might daydream of peace years away. Or let's say you're in prison. You're almost into your fifties and have another 18 years. But that whole time you're also out somewhere with others, lover or children, and you bought where your father's bull pups are just smiling as you and your brothers kick around. You're breathing deeply as the winds toss the fragrance of roses around like they do on the outside. And no matter what, no matter where they are, or what they do to us, we can live like we never die. The world will get cold, a star among stars, just a speck in a blue velvet tumult our world shake and glide, though it does, will grow cold. Not vapors or dead clouds, but rolling in absolute stillness and some dark caprice of non-being. Not gone, not beyond, just not. Even those overwhelmed by grief, the grief of the present, that awful eternity, who won't forgive life for its being, even such people in such mix, mixed up pain, must admit, in some way or other, I lived. <clears throat> and another one from, from my first book here. I have heard, you know, there's such bad news about how everybody's doing. Um, perhaps it's, there's a, a, a positive some positives come out of a an experience being home with your beloved. Here's a little sonnet about that kind of thing called lovers. The air is hot, it whispers, it has lips. It whispers like good news. The beer is cold. She lumbers for one more. Hey, where'd she go, he thinks, but turns and thinks, oh, there she is. He's sitting by her on the floor with lime peels, open tubes of paint, some Jonathan Richmond's playing. One of them's been painting. Dos Equis are being knocked back. He finds he knows where she is. She sees him. It's summer. They're on the floor. The music's like good news. I get a facial tick when I drink too much Coke, he says. Each time I brush my teeth, I think about Wisconsin, she nods. They whisper, purse their lips. It's all good news. A little one from Francois Villon, the French poet. Less happy. Vivisectus frost, vivacious wind, my bread is baked. I'm shocked like Margot, like us all. Like angels, like Villon, we're praying naked. Like a rat trap needs a rat to maul, open mouth. We're on our knees, wine soaked, no stopping time. We choke, giving each other meat and drink here in our hall. Just a couple more. Veritas. <clears throat> Imagining, this is the uh, yes, last poem in my first book. Veritas, imagining heaven as Istanbul or a beach south of Istanbul where your friends are preparing an apartment for you and your beloved and sleeping fathers, babies plump and shining as good faith, memory in the faithful heat, you and she in the fastening and fastenings of heat and poetry just capers and leafy thoughts above. Just Orpheus exhausted now but coughing little plaints 
just memory rewritten, honey, just like Louis Armstrong's voice, like some big happy face, just living, living, honey, just believe, don't understand so much, just come to bed, she said. And I'll conclude with a poem um, that's uh, based on a painting by Eric Fischel called Swimming Lovers. And the poem is called Song. Not death by water, but life, feisty currents nibbling each other, radiant shimmying blues and dandelionish pulse. They float for a century and there you have Genesis. There you have the moon laying all the stars like eggs. There you have legs and breasts and births and the shimmy shimmy of family history wiggling under the surface. There you have Carl moving weird and slow like the moment. Not death, but water, lives feisty and nibbling each other, a radiating hop and there you have it dandelionish light playing among the currents as they yip at one another. Hear the treble and slap like piano keys tap fast and hard, like Wallace off playing full throttle. And there you have life in its genesis, blue shimmering rhythms grinding and swimming together. It's funky, that leafy blue, which hops and bounces, settles and swirling. The moon must have laid all those stars, Jim says to Huck. How else are you going to explain it? Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Good job. I want to thank everybody here. Let's all unmute each other so we can clap. Yay! <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. That was our first, uh, I guess, our first official uh, live streaming Muse event for the most part. We've had tried it before, but this is definitely fun. I want to thank all of you guys for coming here and uh, clap. I'm going to clap for everyone one more time. Yeah. Great words. And also, thanks for everybody watching and who's going to watch. And don't forget the Muse. Check out all the links below, all the things about uh, the authors and the uh, the poets and, and readers. We have... Uh, I made a virtual program so you can feel like you're sitting there while you watch it and uh, you can uh, download that. And also don't don't forget to check out the Muse, the-muse.org for uh, all the classes that are coming up, okay? So thank you for watching. Thanks for all you guys for joining.